darkness falls earlier, we wait for your light. As people in your world continue to suffer from war, we wait for your peace. As people suffer the effects of terrible typhoons in the Philippines, we wait for the reconciliation of creation. We pray, come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> kind of uh, when you're watching the news lately and uh, seeing what's happening in the Philippines, you kind of think, you know all that stuff we keep hearing about from Toronto? It just seems kind of minor. <laughs> Maybe we could just focus on these big events. Uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, quite astounding. Um, I put up on the board uh, a little bit of what we did over the last couple of weeks, just as a review, because um, I thought if I start trying to write this all down uh, as we kind of talk about it at the beginning, it'll be too much. So in the first class, uh, just a bit of a recap for those of you who might not have been here the first uh, couple of weeks. Um, in the first class, we talked about Old Testament hope, and we looked at a number of Old Testament passages that uh, talked about the hope for people in exile and uh, people after the exile. And that hope had a number of different components to it. Most notably, it was a very this-worldly hope. People were looking for, uh, the prophets talked about hopes for peace, of a time when there would be no violence, of, of justice. In Isaiah 65, we actually called that a different economy because it talked about people growing food and getting to eat it themselves, people building houses that they got to live in, sort of everything structured differently. Um, there was a hope for the return to the land from people who were gone in exile. I hope that the land would be fruitful once more, where it uh, had become barren. A hope that God would rule, uh, that God would come either, uh, that God would rule either through a king, a human king, or that God would just come in God's very self and rule the people. Um, a hope for forgiveness, for healing. There's texts that talk about uh, the blind seeing and um, and the lame walking. Um, uh, here I've got good news for the poor and for the hungry. It's kind of tied in with justice and a different economy. Um, that the vulnerable would be cared for. Uh, that was from Isaiah 42. Remember we talked about, uh, the passage talked about a dimly burning wick not being quenched and a bruised reed not being broken. There's a sense of the vulnerable find a place um, in this hoped for kingdom. And part of this all we noticed was that there is judgment on the violent and on the unjust, and in some places, judgment on the foreigners. So the flip side of this um, redemption for those who are poor, or those who are su suffering, is judgment on those who cause, who cause that suffering and who cause that injustice to happen. So there's judgment as part of this. Does that make sense? Is there anything I've forgotten that you recall from that first week that stood out? Martha's looking through her Bible. Hmm. <laughs> what did I write down? Uh, <laughs> um, and then last week, we looked at, at Jesus. And we started by looking at uh, what the expectations were. Oh, here comes the car load from, from Kobe. Uh, we started by looking at the expectations from last, uh, of people in Jesus' time. And many of those expectations uh, were similar to the Old Testament hope. So expectations for healing and forgiveness also tied in with an expectation that God would come and drive the Romans from the land. They were suffering under Roman rule um, and that they would be able to live in peace in their own land again. And then we looked at how Jesus fulfilled those hopes and expectations. And that's some of this stuff here. Um, so Jesus fed the hungry and brought healing and forgiveness and good news for the poor. Um, Jesus welcomed the outcasts. Um, and then there were ways that Jesus fulfilled these hopes that were unexpected. Um, so for instance, people expected God to come and be king, but Jesus was a servant king. Right? 
and a suffering servant king. So people had expected a king to come who, who would rule and drive out the Romans, but instead Jesus welcomed the foreigners um, and, uh, and of course died on the cross. Welcome guys. I'm just doing a, over, uh, a bit of a um, uh, summary of what we did the last two weeks. So that's kind of on the board here. We, we kind of looked at the Old Testament hopes, um, and then we looked at how Jesus fulfilled those hopes uh, or not last, last week. So, so on the one hand, while Jesus fulfilled a lot of the Old Testament hope in terms of you know, bringing healing and forgiveness and reconciliation with creation and welcoming people, um, what Jesus also did was overturn those hopes by welcoming in people whom the first century Jews thought wouldn't be welcomed, um, like Samaritans, like Gentiles, like the Canaanite woman. And then Jesus overturned those, their expectations about what the Messiah would be like, what, what a ruler would be like in actually dying on the cross and then rising from the dead. So there's this, this um, on the one hand, they're all looking at Jesus saying, yes, 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 this looks like the kingdom. And on the other hand, people are saying, what the heck, <laughs> this isn't quite what we expected. Um, and you, you get that sense when John the Baptist sends, sends some of his followers from when he's in prison and says to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect another? And Jesus says, you go back and tell John, you know, that the poor have good news preached to them and, 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 and uh, you know, the hungry are fed and the lame walk and the blind see. And, you know, he kind of lists all these things, you know, if you know the prophecies, yes, I'm the one who is to come. Um, interestingly enough, when Jesus uh, sends that work, word back uh, to John the Baptist, he omits uh, the prisoners are set free. Are you guys, ah, come on in. <laughs> There's a couple seats right up here. Okay. Yeah. So I've just been doing a bit of an overview of, um, a bit of a summary of the last, last couple weeks. So there's this kind of, this kind of disconnect, right? You know, John the Baptist is saying he kind of looks like he fulfills the promises, but, but not quite. Um, and the Pharisees too, they know these prophecies and they see what Jesus is doing. They see that he's offering forgiveness and healing and good news. And that's why they keep inviting him to dinner, right? And of course at these dinners, Jesus kind of overturns what the Pharisees expect the kingdom to be like. You know, he says, when you have a dinner, don't, don't invite people who, who, can, who you can invite back, who will invite you back, but invite the poor and the lame, um, those who can't, and the blind, those who can't reciprocate. That's who you should invite. So there's this, and the Pharisees are thinking, okay, well, he's doing all these things that look like a fulfillment of the kingdom hope, but then he keeps twisting it in a way that isn't what we expect. This isn't what it's supposed to look like. So, uh, so there's, this, this confusion. And after um, Jesus' death and resurrection in the early church, you can see that continuing. You can see that kind of, is, is this what the kingdom looks like? And I think that's why there's so much, um, when, uh, when you get to the book of Acts, I mean, riots are breaking out, breaking out when the uh, apostles are preaching about Jesus. Why is that? Well, because there are expectations for what the kingdom should look like. And on the one hand, okay, it sounds like Peter's preaching about fulfillment of these prophecies, but on the other hand, this is a crucified Messiah who was then raised from the dead. That's not how the story was supposed to end. Right, so so Jesus has turned turned their hopes kind of kind of on their head. Does that make sense? That's a quick thumbnail sketch <laughs> of what we we did in the last uh, the last two weeks. What we're going to do tonight is look at um, at the early church and see what how how the early church fulfilled some of this Old Testament hope. 
Um, but then also um, what, what people were still waiting for in, in the early church and in the, in the community who followed Jesus. So let me uh, make some space here so we can put some stuff up. So you've memorized this all, right? So when I start asking questions, you can remember what's up there <laughs> for the test that's coming at the end, right? You knew about that? Actually, my very first teaching was at Ontario Bible College exactly 20 years ago. And uh, now what I think about it, and I was teaching a class of 90 students, which meant I didn't know anybody at the back, um, who would? put up their hands and say, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> it drove me crazy all the time. <laughs> Which is why I like doing lay education. <laughs> Nobody's actually worried about the test. The early church, on the one hand, was looking at the things that were happening and thinking that the kingdom had somehow ar arrived. And on the other hand, the early church was waiting because they knew that we're still waiting for something. And this kind of tension, uh, we tend to talk about as the already not yet. The kingdom's already here, but not yet, <laughs> right? There's this, it's this tension that we live with as Christians. So we're going to explore that a little bit, what that looks like uh, this evening. Um, and then think about that not yet. What are we waiting for? What, what, what is our Advent hope? So let's focus for a minute on the already. If you think about the Old Testament prophecies that we looked at and uh, Jesus' ministry and what that tells us about the kingdom, what things were happening in the early church that made it look like the kingdom was already here? Can you think, can you think of anything? Karen? People were being healed. Okay, so people, yeah. Okay. Okay, so people were being healed throughout, throughout the book of Acts. So right already in Acts chapter 3, there's, um, there's a lame man, and, and he's healed right outside the temple. And it's, and it's a story that's really reminiscent of some of the gospel stories. Um, somebody, uh, somebody named, I'm going to pronounce this wrong probably, Aeneas, uh, somebody who's paralyzed. This is in Acts chapter 9. He is sick. Uh, he is healed. Um, does this name mean anything to any of you? Tabitha? I don't know if... I grew up at the time of the show Bewitched. <laughs> so <laughs> when I see Tabitha, I think of Bewitched, but it's actually a name from the Bible. Who would have thought? Um, Tabitha actually was somebody who was raised from the dead, uh, also in Acts chapter, chapter 9. So the apostles in the early church, they were going out and healings were happening um, and people were being brought back to life. And so this, this fulfilled those ancient prophecies and, it's, and it continued what was happening when Jesus was alive. Um, healing, healing is happening. What else? What's something else that happened uh, in the early church that might have suggested that the hopes were fulfilled. Karen? Okay. Okay, so the widows, the widows were being cared for. Here, I'll, num I'll number some of these. Um, this is actually Acts chapter 6. But the number seven is the number of deacons who, who were set up for them. Um, so, so you have a community. Uh, and, well, let me back up a bit. This, this is significant because already in Acts 2, right after Pentecost, um, this is right at the end of, of Acts chapter 2. Let's turn to that, actually. And, and we'll, because uh, this kind of builds up to the Greek Greek widows. So Acts is in the New Testament. Um, 
right after the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. I'll say something. Uh, generally thought that the book of Acts was written by the same person who wrote Luke. So uh, Luke wrote both Luke and Acts. So the story, if you read them together, it's, it's kind of a continuation. And you'll see a lot of the same themes in Acts that you see in Luke. So for instance, uh, Jesus is, um, you know, the Pharisees judge Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners. You get the same charge against the disciples in Acts for eating with Gentiles. We'll come to that in a minute, actually. So there's echoes between the books. So Acts number two, or sorry, chapter two. And uh, if you begin at verse 44, right at the end of the chapter. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So you have this vision of a community and, and I'll come to the widows in a minute, uh, of a community that's practicing um, a certain generosity, a certain kind of economic generosity. So every day they're meeting and together, sharing things in salt common and distributing the proceeds of selling their own goods to those who were in need. If you turn to Acts chapter 4, so this is, and I should say, this is ha what happens on Pentecost, this is the result of the Spirit coming, right? There's this sermon by Peter, and then what did people do? People were baptized, and this is the kind of community they formed. Now let's take a look at Acts 4, verse 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, again, this um, what, what I love about this passage is there's this reference to them sharing everything um, and sharing with those who had need. And, and right in the middle of it is this, they gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So there's this... None of them had private possessions. They proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus, and there was not a needy person among them. It's kind of like, oh, uh, how are those things connected, right? It's not just a random little thought about, you know, Paul, you know uh, Luke was so ADD that he had to mention the resurrection in the middle of talking about economic matters. Um, remember, we, we talked uh, last week about how the resurrection was a hope for this whole new social order right? This, this overturning of the way things are. And so in proclaiming the resurrection, they were proclaiming that God's kingdom had come. Everything had been turned on its head. And that's why a new economic practice was being followed. Because when the kingdom comes, all our old categories around money are changed. And, and they were sharing everything. So uh, you have Acts 2, Acts 4, which is why when you get to Acts chapter 6, um, there's a complaint that the Greek widows are not being looked after. Well, in light of these other passages, this makes perfect sense. So you might say, well, why were they expecting the apostles to be looking after these women anyway? Well, because that's the shape of the community. This was a, a characteristic of the community. And I actually think this passage in Acts 6 is interesting because what the apostles say when the complaint comes, they say, well, 
let's let's choose some other people to look after those widows because you know we're too bu busy preaching to wait on tables and so they choose seven deacons one of whom is named Stephen the very next thing that happens in the story is those apostles who were too busy preaching to wait on tables they actually disappear for a while the next person we meet is Stephen one of the deacons who was chosen chosen to wait on tables because other people were preaching. And what's Stephen doing? He's preaching. And in fact, he becomes the first martyr because of his preaching. So it's this kind of, uh, it's like the story is, is uh, hinting, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, you know what, maybe this was a mistake because it turns out Stephen, who's looking after these widows, that's what he was chosen for, ends up being such a powerful preacher of the gospel that he is a threat to the governing authorities. There's something intricately linked between looking after those in need and preaching in Luke's gospel. In fact, way back in Luke chapter 9, when the 70 come back from doing, uh, or is it the 70 or the 12? It might just be the 12. From, from going out and preaching the kingdom and healing the sick, and they come back and they're fought, there's all these people around, thousands of people. And the disciples say to Jesus, we've got to send them away. We don't have any food. And Jesus says, no, no, you feed them. And it's clear. This link is made in, in all the Gospels. It's clear that Jesus is saying, look, if I'm going to be sending you out to preach, then you also know, have to know how to feed people. These things go together. Um, and that's when they say, well, you know, we've only got whatever it was, two loaves and five fishes. <laughs> and Jesus says, that's enough. You know, you can feed people with that. So it's this, this link that you get again and again in, in these Gospels. And it's very clear here uh, in Acts. So you have a certain kind of economic generosity in the early church. And it's not just in the book of Acts. Can anybody think where else in the epistles Paul talks about money and our attitudes to money? Pretty much in all the letters, yeah. It's one of these overlooked themes when you're studying Paul. It's like, oh, wait a minute, there he, he's talking about money again. So for instance, in Galatians chapter two, um, uh, Paul, is, um, Paul is converted and eventually he goes to Jerusalem to meet with the other apostles. And he tells the story in Galatians chapter two. And then at a certain point, um, I'm just gonna get the exact reference. Galatians two verse 10, Paul says that, that the other apostles were happy for him to go and preach to the Gentiles. But there's one thing they wanted him to remember. Remember the poor. And sometimes our translations, I think, downplay it. Because they'll say, they asked only this of me, that I remember the poor. Like, you know, and by the way, there's this other little thing we want you to do. Whereas in the Greek, it's the sense, there is only one thing they wanted me to remember. Remember the poor. <laughs> like this is, you know, there's a front and central thing. Don't, don't forget it. And Paul says, which of course I was eager to do. That very thing I was eager to do. Um, in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he talks about the collection that he's taking up for the believers in uh, Judea. And um, what happened in Judea at this time, so by this point, Paul is... Um, Preaching to churches in Asia Minor, I should have, I should have brought a map. <laughs> Preaching to churches in Asia Minor. Um, and there, is, uh, there were a number in the first century, a number of famines in the land of Judea. So uh, believers, so those very first Christians who were Jews who became Christians back in Jerusalem and, and Judea and Galilee, uh, they were suffering from the results of these famines. And so Paul was collecting money for them on all of his journeys. And he refers to this collection in a number of his letters. Um, so 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he spends a lot of time talking to the Corinthians about putting money aside that he's collecting for the believers in Judea. Um, even if you don't have very much, just put a little bit aside every week. 
He talks about the Thess Thessalonian church, the churches in Macedonia who have been putting aside money for this purpose. In Romans, Romans chapter 15, he refers to this collection. In fact, uh, in Romans 15, he tells the church there, that he's, or the churches there, that he's going to come to Rome after he has brought the collection to Jerusalem. And of course, what happens is Paul goes to Jerusalem with this money and he is arrested. Um, and uh, he's, he's charged with bringing Gentiles into the court of the temple. Um, and he appeals to Caesar. And so he does end up in Rome, but he ends up in Rome as a prisoner. Uh, that's how he gets sent. So it's actually his desire to bring this collection back to Jerusalem that gets him arrested. And then there's other places in the letter where he talks about uh, what he would like this community to be like. So in <coughs> Romans 12, uh, he talks about, um, this would be Romans 12, verse 13. He talks about um, uh, sharing with those in need and extending hospitality to strangers, which would be sharing your food and drink with strangers. Um, in, in verse 16 of Romans 12, he talks about, I think our translations usually say, associate with the lowly. But what Paul actually says is, walk with the oppressed. And that, that word oppressed is used for the poor uh, throughout, throughout the Old Testament. So there's this sense in which uh, in Acts we have kind of this narrative which talks about how things have changed economically for this community. And then there are various texts which talk about it. And then as we move beyond the New Testament, um, there's a lot of evidence, some, a lot of it narrative evidence, again, about how the early church actually practiced this kind of radical economic sharing. So the early church was known for taking widows in. Um, one way that uh, in the Roman Empire, people tried to make sure that they didn't have too many children or that they didn't have girls uh, was to abandon children, right? Well, the church became known, church communities became known, Christian communities, I should say, became known for taking these children in and raising them. Often what would happen to abandoned children if they didn't die was they would be taken as slaves um, and raised in very abusive ways often as, as slaves. Uh, so, so Christians were going out and, and rescuing these children from the, from the streets. So uh, we know that this kind of uh, economic sharing that we see in Acts continued on into the first centuries of, of the early church. Um, there's a, a scholar, a historian called Peter Brown, who uh, has written just a slim little volume about this that's very good. And I'm trying to, I think it's called Poverty and Leadership in the Early Church or something, something like that. If you want to know, ask me and I can tell you for sure afterwards, I can look it up. But, um, and, and he writes about all, how this played out in the early church. Because sometimes when I was growing up, I was always told that this Acts 2 and Acts 4, that that was an experiment that the early church engaged in and it failed. Right? They tried to share their money and they failed. And that's why Paul had to do this collection because they were all starving. <laughs> and, so, and, and, and actually, no, this, this lasted for a number of centuries, this kind of an economic practice. And the reason they were starving because was there was a famine. You know? <laughs> so, so there was external factors that were connected to that. So are there questions about that? So, so this is one way that, that people would look at the community and say, this is the hope fulfilled. This is the Old Testament hope that society has been turned over, that the poor are looked after. Things, things are coming to fruition in this community. And we know by the way that Paul had to write in his letters that it didn't all happen perfectly in these communities. But you can sense that there was this start, this start there. What else? What else was happening in the early church, can you think of, that might have fulfilled some of the, that, those Old Testament hopes? The Gentiles were being welcomed. The Gentiles were being welcomed. So, and not just the Gentiles either. Um, yeah, so, so you had, 
you had well come into the community. Um, and again, Acts gives us, uh, tells us about a couple of these. Um, let's start first with Acts 8. Um, the Ethiopian eunuch. Do people know this story? Uh, whoa. Martha's Bible just jumped off the table there. <laughs> That was the Bible saying, yes, yes, I know the story, I know the story. Um, if you look at Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We're going to look at this one and then look at an Old Testament passage that relates to it. And then we'll get to the Gentiles, Susan, after this. Verse 26 of Acts 8. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. I like that in brackets, you know, just, just so you know. You're not gonna find a comfort station halfway along. A wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace Queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He, said, he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Now that's from Isaiah 53, of course. And the eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. There's a lot of lovely phrases in that story, and I love how it ends. Went on his way rejoicing. Now, there's so much we don't know about this. Um, was, uh, was this eunuch Jewish? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, was he just a God-fearer? So a Gentile who had come to Jerusalem as a God-fearer uh, to worship the Jewish God. Um, we do know that in the Old Testament, there are texts that talk about eunuchs um, in, in the, the books of the law, not being allowed into certain courts into the temple, right? Because they've been, they have mutilated genitals is the way the text um, nicely puts it. So uh, in the prophetic books, however, there, there is a reversal of this. If you turn with me to Isaiah 56. So there's this sense, in fact, this prophecy reinforces this sense that, that eunuchs were, I mean, so a eunuch is somebody who's been castrated, right? Um, and, uh, and, and usually court officials were turned into eunuchs because that meant they would not, there would be kind of no uh, ambition because they would have no offspring that they'd want to inherit any kind of role in the, in the courts. So um, there's this, the, so the problem with a eunuch was a eunuch was not fruitful, right? There would be no offspring. And in ancient Israel, this disqualified you from certain roles. Um, so Isaiah 56 verse 3, you have this uh, prophecy. 
Well, I'll begin at, at verse 1 of Isaiah 56. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. This is that theme of justice that we've had the whole way through. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Happy is the mortal who does this, the one who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and refrains from doing every evil. Mel, um, yeah, there's a page number for Isaiah. Now verse 3. Do not let the foreigner joined to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. So, you know, a foreigner coming in, unless they were circumcised, was not part of the people of Israel, right? Because they were not Jewish. And Isaiah is saying, don't let the foreigner say, the Lord will surely separate me. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. There's actually in the Hebrew a kind of a play on the word for castration there with shall not be cut off. Um, so this sense that, that eunuchs who were considered less than full people really, are now going to be part uh, of, of God's people. And the foreigners, verse 6, who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. So um, that's uh, what Jesus says, right? After the cleansing of the temple. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. So you have this prophecy in Isaiah about foreigners and eunuchs who were excluded from the covenant people. Um, I think eunuchs could be part of the covenant people, but were kind of excluded from the covenant because there would be no inheritance, right? There's, they're kind of, there's this, they're, they're kind of a weird people. They don't fit in. Um, and one of the first conversions you have in Acts is this Ethiopian eunuch who's welcomed in um, and who says, you know, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And it could be that Philip would have said, well, uh, you, know, uh, <laughs> you know, actually there's some problems with people like you, but he doesn't say that. Um, and he's baptized. And then the next thing that happens, I'll get your hand in a sec, Susan, is um, then from Acts 10 to Acts 15, there's this long narrative about, you'll remember Peter sees this uh, blanket come down onto the roof and this voice says, filled with all these unclean animals, and this voice says, take and eat. And Peter says, oh, you know, God, I've never eaten anything unclean. I couldn't Probably it doesn't say, oh God, he says, oh Lord, <laughs> I couldn't possibly eat this. And the blanket's whisked up, right? And then it comes down again, and this happens three times. And then a messenger comes from uh, from a um, Gentile, Cornelius, and asks Peter to come visit him. And Cornelius talks about all the work that God is doing in his life. And Peter baptizes him, even though he did not first become a Jew, which is how... Uh, up until that point, everybody who became a Christian was a Jew. Um, and the assumption was you had to become a Jew because Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. You had to become a Jew before you could become a Christian. And Peter was saying, no. Gen and, and Gentiles can come in. And of course, the reason you wanted Gentiles to be circumcised is because Gentiles were considered highly immoral. Um, and the way to guarantee that they would not be such immoral people anymore was they would agree to follow Torah. And the sign of agreeing to follow Torah was being circumcised. So this was the logical progression. You want to become part of Israel's Messiah, part of his body, you become Jewish. In Acts 15, um, 
there's this meeting in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Council, and they have to make a decision about Gentiles. And it says, after no small dissension and discussion. <laughs> in other words, they had a knockdown debate about this for a whole day. <laughs> and at the end of it, um, James decided that, yes, Gentiles could be part of this community without first becoming Jewish, without becoming circumcised. This was earth shattering because the rest of Paul's letters are still having big discussions. These communities are still having discussions about this point. We know that this was highly contentious for many years, this decision. Um, but that's the shape of the community. We see this welcome for those who are considered dubious um, and they're welcomed in to the community. And, and uh, these texts and acts show that most clearly. Susan, did you want to? I'm just wondering, because in, in the Isaiah uh, texts around the, the welcoming of the eunuchs and the mm -hmm. brothers, it seems like covenant and Sabbath are mm -hmm. the two things that you have to do. And I'm wondering if then the covenant gets expressed in baptism. In baptism. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that's our expression of covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point because I should have said, I mean, the covenant language in Isaiah would have meant circumcision, would have meant circumcision right? Covenant. So, yeah. But for the early church, that's right. Covenant becomes evident in baptism. That's where covenantal language starts to be be used. So that becomes, instead of circumcision, that becomes the replacement for now. Now this is, um, this is a, a later theological description of what goes on, because yeah. you don't find that actually said in the biblical text anywhere. <coughs> but, but he asked to be baptized, yeah. Um, and so, which is why reading that Isaiah passage, any first century Jew would have said, oh yeah, they're welcome in the eunuchs and, and the foreigners, but as long as they're circumcised, as long as they become part of the, the covenant, um, that would hurt, yes. That's why there wasn't, you know, exactly a rush, Jewish converts, <laughs> on behalf of adult men, anyway. <laughs> um, which is why there were a lot, but there were a lot of God fears, so people who were kind of adherents to Jew, Judaism, but who did not, not convert. But you're right. I think um, I think this 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 is partly why later theologians talk about baptism as becoming that new covenant sign of the covenant, because that's the way it starts to function in these texts in the in the New Testament. Are they um, getting that from this connection, do you think, or is that? I see that. Yeah, I think it could be. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a view of baptism that coheres with infant baptism, right? So it's, it's a view of baptism that we have in, um, in Anglican uh, Reformed traditions like Presbyterian and, and you know, Christian Reformed. Um, it's not a view, that covenantal view of baptism is not at all Mennonite, Baptist, Pentecostal, none of, you, none of those adult baptism, yeah. So the Anabaptist traditions, I guess, or, so, um, or the Baptist traditions. So yeah, it's, it's a very specific form of covenant that you get in certain theological uh, strands only. And it's still you know, up for some debate. I mean, I married somebody who was converted when he was 16 and baptized when he was 16 uh, in Lake Shandoss in September, which was apparently very cold. <laughs> and who doesn't really think my infant baptism probably took. He's always trying to throw me in lakes, you know. You haven't really been baptized, have you? So when we had kids, it was, it was quite the debate. You know, what's, uh, <laughs> is it this covenantal view of baptism in which, which means that, um, you know, one way to describe it is it, it's saying that God has claimed you, right, if infants are baptized, um, or is baptism a choice you make? Right, in which case you you wait. Um, so we, I won. <laughs> so you know, Lydia, do you think you should have been? You should we should have waited? Do you think? She's at a Bible study, so I think maybe she would have chosen it if she had a chance. <laughs> um, 
But you're right, Susan, that's a, a background to that. I, I paid her to come, really. That's <laughs> <laughs> I want to know who threw her in the lake. Who threw her, who threw her in the lake? In the lake <laughs> well, she's gone voluntarily in the lake. But uh, actually, we do have a picture of Brian holding her near a bird bath in the backyard. <laughs> so that, that might have been it. He also doesn't believe clergy have to baptize. So there's all kinds of things going on there. But any Christian can baptize, exactly. So yeah. Um, other places where this theme comes up in Paul writings, Paul's writings, of course, are 1 Corinthians 12, where you have Paul talking about the body, right? Uh, the body that makes up this community of believers. And he talks about how uh, those members of the body that are the most vulnerable we treat with the greater honor. Right, this is passage of, uh, that, that talks about a different way of organizing. Well, let's, let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians 12. So if you have Acts in front of you, then there's Romans and then Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12. Next year, I'm actually going to be doing a course on Paul. So we'll look at more of these letters. For not everybody likes Paul, but I really do. So, 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, and I'll begin at verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 12. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the one body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, <coughs> Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. This is a really profound description, I think, <laughs> of what the body of believers is to be. It's this, this emphasis on the one spirit and the one body and this diversity of gifts and this emphasis on the importance of even the most minor gift, the most minor part of the body, and the treating of the weaker parts of the body with more honor and more respect. It's a turning on its head of a metaphor that was central in the Roman Empire. The body politic was a, was a, 
uh, an image, a metaphor that was used for the, the Roman Empire itself with Caesar at the head. And the empire would talk about all these different gifts within that body politic, but those more important parts of the body would get greater honor and greater respect. And Paul is turning that completely over. This body uh, doesn't function anything like Roman society. It doesn't function anything like society outside of the church. This is a body where those that would be considered less honorable or weaker are the ones who get greater respect and greater care. So it's this, um, I use the word welcome here uh, to describe this community because not only is it a community that welcomes in those you wouldn't expect, but a community that, that expresses greater welcome for those who normally aren't welcomed anywhere. Here they have a home in this body of Christ. It's really a very important uh, description that, that Paul has here and a very, a very beautiful one. So, and there are other passages that talk about uh, how this community practices a different kind of welcome, a different kind of relationship. The whole, the whole book of Ephesians, um, which I, I won't read any of it here, but especially chapter 2, which talks about the breaking down of the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. So you have here Paul, Paul talking about those who have greater honor and less honor and greater respect and less respect. Um, in Ephesians 2, he's talking about the, the Jew-Gentile divide, how that disappears. He actually referred to that in, in 1 Corinthians 12 as well, and he refers to it in Galatians 3, and he does in Colossians um, 3, verse 11. So, you know, Paul comes back to this again and again. It it's, has to do with status, this community, that wall is broken down. Ethnic difference, that wall is broken down. Um, this is a community that practices a different ethic with each other. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about about it's that bit? Really a question. Yeah, I think it, it's because they all have a common goal, right? Like they're all they, they're changed and they're they're looking for something different. They're not mm -hmm. they're not looking for for the power. That's right. Yeah, and actually, Paul talks about that when he says, you know, the spirit for the common good. And he talks, throughout his letters, he talks about upbuilding the body, that all of this is for the sake of the body of the church. Um, and, and, and it's tied in with being part of the body of Christ, right? We, we, we share this story, this narrative. So yeah, that's, that's really important. There, uh, what the goals of ancient imperial society or contemporary North American society are not the goals of this body in Christ. It's, it's something fundamentally different, yeah. So that would have been, that would have been another reason why people sort of thought, it's here, our hopes are fulfilled. There's this different kind of community uh, where things happen fundamentally differently in how people relate to each other. Uh, one more, one more before we, I mean, there's, there's more than one more, but one more before we take a break. <laughs> What's, what would be another reason? why people might have thought, okay, these hopes are fulfilled. So we might be able to do two more. Well, what's something else that happens in Acts when, uh, when the apostles are um, imprisoned, for instance? Okay. So there, there's, there's sort of, you have this, um, this nonviolence that's practiced by them. And what else? Well, you know, I should clean this board so you can actually see the, <laughs> the weight a bit better. What else? Um, they're in prison. They're singing. And they're singing, and there's an earthquake, and they're free. They're free. Um, that time they didn't leave. But there's another time when Peter, an angel, comes and sets Peter free. This is, uh, this is such a great story because, of course, he, he goes and he goes to a house of believers and he knocks on the door, and the servant girl who comes to the door is so overwhelmed that it's Peter, she doesn't open the door. She just runs. <laughs> and he's like, wait a minute, let me in <laughs> before I get picked up again. Um, that's, that's Acts 12, actually. Um, so you've, you've, got, you've got stories of, of healings and prisoners being set free. That isn't always the case, though, right? Paul ends up in prison numerous times. Um, so, yeah, but you do have this sort of um, 
uh, the nonviolence and the peace that runs uh, throughout throughout this community. So um, you have the language. You, first of all, the apostles don't fight back when they're arrested. And even that first freeing story with the earthquake, they didn't leave. They stayed. Paul and the others stayed because they didn't want the jailer to be punished. Right? When Peter in Acts 12 runs off, you know what happens to the jailer? He's put to death for letting the, the prisoner escape. Um, so after that uh, earthquake, or after they're singing hymns and, and, and Paul is freed, the, the jailer actually pulls his sword to kill himself before they kill him for letting the, and Paul says, no, no, we're not going anywhere. And the jailer actually becomes, becomes a follower of Jesus. Um, you get this language of peace and forgiveness. Um, so forgiveness would be part of this. Um, throughout Paul's letters. That theme of forgiveness and grace is enormous in Paul's letters, right? Um, the language and, and the language of peace, uh, Romans 12 is a really important passage. This is the passage that says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Um, you know, do not return evil for evil. This is, I'll give you the verses for that. That's 14, Romans 12, 14 to 21. Um, it's just a very important passage. Uh, 1 Thessalonians also says not to return evil. Uh, I think it's 5 verse 15. Yeah not to return evil for evil. And of course, this is a theme that's been picked up from the Gospels, right? Where Jesus says uh, to love your enemies. And, and Paul picks this up throughout his letters, both in his practice and in the things he says to the other communities. So in that, um, in the Old Testament text we looked at, do you remember we looked at some of these texts and uh, the coming of peace was often tied up with the defeat of enemies, right? There's going to be peace because God has come and trampled down the Moabites or whoever it is. In these passages, there's peace because of forgiveness, because of not exerting violence back on those who have first engaged in it. So there's a different dynamic. And of course, that's rooted in Jesus right? How does Jesus defeat evil? But by bearing it, right? By taking evil on himself on the cross until it exhausts himself. That's how Jesus defeats evil, not by fighting it with its own weapons. Um, and that's what this early, this Christian community is to do as well, not fight evil with the weapons of evil, but bear evil and return good for evil. Um, that's how they follow a crucified Messiah. Incidentally, this is the, uh, anybody here read Harry Potter? Should I even bother going down this path? I say, okay, I see a hand or two. Okay. I mean, this is the central tension at the heart of Harry Potter, right? You know, should, should Harry be fighting against the followers of Voldemort using the weapons of violence, using Voldemort's own weapons? And he consistently says no though he does give in to the temptation a couple of times himself, right? And, and, and it became clear as, as I was reading the series that J.K. Rowling was going, this was going to be the linchpin for the series. How, how in the end would Harry defeat evil without engaging in, in the weapons of evil? And lo and behold, she pulls it off, which is just astounding, which is why when after the series was over and she confessed that she didn't want people to know she was a Christian because then they might know how the story would end, uh, I thought that was really, first of all, I thought that was a really interesting lack of understanding of most Christians <laughs> and the fact that they would be expecting something violent, <laughs> um, but, but really an interesting insight into what she saw as the heart of the Christian message, right? Which is that you don't fight evil with the weapons of evil. Um, that's at the heart of Paul's uh, gospel here. So this is another way in which, you know, um, on the one hand, the hope is fulfilled this is a context, a community of peace, a community of forgiveness. 
but not quite in the way people had expected, right? This is kind of a twist on that Old Testament hope. It's there in the Old Testament tradition, um, but there are other threads of retribution in that tradition uh, that Jesus hasn't, hasn't picked up. Mm -hmm.